so okay so we're gonna switch topics okay and we're gonna talk about your favorite dark souls 3 yay <laughs> okay so you're like really good with definitions um like english definitions compared to like japanese definitions uh about uh, the game you sure <laughs> I wanted to ask you some things. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's like the definition game. It's like a quiz, okay. basically. What are the Ashen? Okay. Um, the way the opening of the game describes it is like when the fire is fading to the point where we can't even get Lords of Cinder to link it again. The bell tolls and it wakes up what the game calls nameless accursed undead who are unfit to be Cinder, as in unfit to be the Lords of Cinder. So it's like, it's the absolute last, kind of like last uh, resort is to get these these undead who aren't even powerful enough to link the fire properly to rise up and to then use them to go get the Lords of Cinder back. And that's kind of what distinguishes them from the undead in the previous games, because it's like, uh, Ashen Ones are so... Uh, Ashen Ones are much supposed to be much weaker in a lot of ways. So their job is to go get the Lords of Cinder back, rather than to link the fire themselves. Although that is what we end up doing in the end of the game anyway. And there's an interview with Miyazaki, and this is one of those things that he mentions in interviews, but then doesn't end up in the game. So it's not clear, like, did he change his mind or did he just not put it in there? But it's still technically what's happening. Which is that the the Ashen one that we're playing as isn't necessarily someone, a specific person who died and got buried and then got risen again. It's like all the, the burned up ashes of the undead kind of like coalesce into this like gestalt consciousness that's made up of all these different people who died and like if you just kind of mush enough of them together there's enough energy to to make a person so we're we're not even like someone with a history we're just like a just like a sort of entity that's created out of out of ash but that does go against like the way that we wake up from a coffin and the way that like we can choose burial gifts and classes and things that that um, imply that we do have a specific history. So I don't know how seriously we're supposed to take that now. Mm -hmm. But that looks like it might have been the original idea, is that we're just like almost like a golem that was made out of ashes okay, rather than a specific person. Okay, cool. Thank you. And what are the unkindled, and how are they different from the ashen? Well, um, the... I think the unkindled just are the ashen ones, but we're unkindled if we don't have a, if we haven't used the um, the ember item, we're unkindled. And when we do use the ember item, we um, in the game at the beginning of the game it says ash seeketh ember. So like when we use this ember item, we absorb the a little piece of the of the fire of the age of fire and the fire that the bonfires that are burning and that kind of empowers us so it's like the difference between hollow and human form in in dark souls like it's the same character and the same thing but we kind of have two different two different modes but they're not they're not distinct i don't think okay cool and this is more from i guess dark souls one what's in the cursed undead I think all undead are accursed because the undead we're undead because we have the undead curse and when they say accursed undead it's just like an extra flourish added to the sentence. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a difference between an undead and an accursed undead. Okay, so what's an undead? Undead? Uh, well, this this is fun. Um, <laughs> going back to like chat stuff, like the way like undead means specific things in when you use it in the West. Like we think of like zombies and vampires and ghosts and things. The way it's written in Japanese isn't undead, it's like undying. And it has the connotation is like, not that you're a zombie who came back from the dead. It's like you're someone who is kind of trapped in this endless cycle. And every time you die, you just come back to life again. And that keeps happening until you have 
uh, completely like your mind has broken and you become you become a hollow right the english one like they went with they went with hollow which is like a very evocative name and i i think i'd not like, when i talk about like japanese versus english stuff i'm not saying the japanese stuff is better i'm not saying they should have gone with because a lot of the time it just wouldn't have made sense to most english speakers but like the word they use for hollow in japanese is moja which is specifically referring to a kind of a kind of form that you take on in buddhist hell where if you've been um if you if you're trapped in one of the hells you become a moja which is like a a kind of like mindless spirit that's driven by hunger so that's kind of that's what the the undead hollow thing is getting at in the in the japanese uh script is like it's not that you're as you, you woke up and you're like a, a vampire or a zombie or something it's like you're cursed to endlessly die and come back to life again until you're broken mm -hmm. spiritually and you lose track of who you are and then you become a moja as though like you are trapped in hell and you're just reliving the same thing over and over again cool okay thank you and you know in dark souls one there's the chosen undead yeah. How is the Chosen Undead different from the Champion of Ash? Well, the Chosen Undead is, it looks like, um, kind of like a lie. It's like, a, it's, um, they say that, like, the Chosen Undead will be the, they say, like, an undead will be chosen to go to an Orlando and receive the Lord Vessel and inherit Gwyn. But it's like, a self-fulfilling prophecy because basically they just keep sending undead to an Orlando. And then eventually when one of them manages to do it, they say, Oh, obviously they were the chosen one. Mm -hmm. So it just keeps happening. And then eventually when it works, they say, Oh, clearly it was that one was the chosen undead. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's like, it's the whole, um, an Orlando thing. Like the, the more you, you look into it in game, the more you realize it's kind of a lie. It's like a story that's told to manipulate you. Mm -hmm. And the Dark Souls 3 Champion of Ash, there's no story to manipulate you? Well, the Champion of Ash, like, you don't have a choice, really. You just, you just get told, get the Lord. You're bound to the shrine, and you have to go get the Lords of Cinder. Cool. All right. <laughs> An easy one. What's the Dark Soul? The Dark Soul is the soul, one of the four souls that was in the first flame. Initially, we figured that the first flame was found by a bunch of what we would think of as hollows. And when they took the flame into themselves, they became Nito the Witch, uh, the Pygmy, and Gwyn. But the more we look into it, especially in light of Dark Souls 3 and what happens in the Ring City, is it looks like Nito the Witch... Gwyn and the pygmies were always there and they found the souls in the flame and that just made them even stronger rather than them all having initially been these hollows the way it plays out in the ring city is like the the pygmies took there was like a group of them and they took the dark soul and Gwyn was frightened of what would happen. So it wasn't like everyone grabbed a piece of soul and became something. It was like Gwyn was already Gwyn. And then he saw that the, the pygmies had taken the dark soul. So when one of the things that's, that's kind of there, but not explicitly talked about is like the four souls are two sets of, of, oppositional pairs so like nito has a soul that is all about death because nito is the death guy and then you have the witch of isolith who like her power is all like um it's these trees that are growing and it's this like she's creating a new flame and she's got all these daughters and everything so it's like she's kind of associated with with life and birth rather than death and then you have gwyn who has this the who's the lord of light and he has a soul that is 
associated with the sun and associated with like things that come from the sky. So his opposite is the dark soul, which is what the pygmies get. So it looks like Gwyn is frightened of what will happen if there is like someone who is opposite to him, means they could overthrow him. So he creates the ring city and he gives it to the pygmies and says like, just stay here. Well, he's a nice guy. He wants to make sure they're okay. He's a, he is, and there's a nice statue of. <laughs> but like the the way the way the undead curse seems to work is that like Gwyn doesn't want the dark soul like becoming stronger. He doesn't want it getting out. Basically, he wants it to stay inside people. Because you you see you see in Dark Souls three that like there's these pus of man creatures that have, look like humans and like their humanity is is running rampant and it's escaping from their bodies and these like weird weird monsters that are growing out of their backs so looks like something happens like when the age of fire starts to fade that happens to humanity because humanity is part of the dark soul which is the opposite to Gwyn who is the one who is linking the fire Okay, the the pygmies take the dark soul, and then the dark soul is spread among the humans, and that's what humanity is. And everything about the undead curse that we learn about in Dark Souls One and Dark Souls Three, not so much two, is that the um, the undead curse is connected to humanity. Like you use humanity and young dead have this humanity that they can take into themselves or they can burn it in bonds. And in Dark Souls 3, it's like humanity is trying to escape from people's bodies and it's like warping and changing them. And in that, the way that humanity is dealt with is that you burn it. And the dark sign that all the undead have is a ring that has flame around it. And that the ring city itself is a giant... Like, literally, it is a ring. It is built to contain them. So it's like the dark sign that's on the undead's bodies is like a... It's almost like a cauterized wound with this flame that stops humanity slash the dark soul from getting out. Because I think what, what Gwyn is, is worried about is, like, what happens when the dark soul becomes too powerful. Karth says this in Dark Souls 1. He talks about how like Gwyn is is frightened that the Dark Soul in hum, in within the humans will lead to the birth of basically Gwyn's opposite. So it looks like the whole undead curse thing is a way to stop almost to like stop humanity slash the Dark Soul from becoming too powerful by locking it inside people with this like burning ring. That stops the the dark soul from from getting because it's it's kind of burning it up. It's like being branded. Like like it's like I, it's like a, it's like they've cauterized the dark soul by doing that. So that would be the seal of fire that is mentioned in the ringed knights. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what happens. The the ringed knights and the the herald knights, who are the the really big uh, fat ones with look like they're made of branches. Mm-hmm. They're they're like two. They're they're kind of the two. Um, branching paths of like what can happen with humanity because like the the ringed knights because they have that that flaming seal on them that stops their humanity going crazy and transforming them so they stay reasonably human mm-hmm. whereas the 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 herald knights they're described as they they're like a group of knights who went to the ringed city but they didn't have a seal of fire put on them by Gwyn. so what's happened to them is their humanity has like warped and changed and bloated them into these like kind of ogre creatures. Mm. So it's like that's that's the point of putting this and like the seal of fire is also like that's kind of what the dark sign on the undead is. It's like we'll put this seal of fire on the undead so that doesn't happen to them. Mm, I see. Um for the ring knights, uh their armor says that the armor of early men was forged in the abyss. What do they mean by that? I have no idea. <laughs> I think the idea is like the um 
the uh, the abyss is where like all the humanity stuff kind of resides. Like you go there in uh, in Dark Souls One when you when you fight the four kings and meet Karth, and like it's also what happens to Ulysseel when they start listening to presumably Karth as well. Mm-hmm. So like the abyss seems to be like that's where um, that's where humanity kind of began, maybe. Mm-hmm. That's like the the birthplace of of Manus and um, the birthplace of all this. Actually, just, Manus is father of the abyss. Yeah, so like it's like the um, yeah the humans kind of maybe began in the abyss and then moved moved on to the moved moved out of the abyss later on when they when like I don't know Gwyn built them cities or something. Okay, how would you define humanity? Humanity is the dark soul that has, instead of being seized by one, one entity, it was seized by the pygmies. Whoever, it, whether this refers to the uh, the eight pygmy kings that you meet in the Ring City, or it just refers to humanity in general, or maybe humanity is the offspring of the eight pygmies. I don't know. Okay. But um, the thing about the Dark Soul is that it's spread out among among humanity as a whole. So, like, humanity as a whole can overthrow Gwyn in the end. Because Gwyn kept his soul. Gwyn keeps his soul to himself and then he ends up splitting it between Seath and the Four Kings in him. Yeah, like, all, all, of, hum- all of the humans have a little piece of the Dark Soul in them, basically. And that's what makes them human. That's like the source of their, um, the source of like their uniqueness. And if you remove that from them, they go back to being hollow. Okay. And you know how in Dark Souls 3, uh, Gale goes on to the Ring City to find the Dark Soul? To find paint. The pigment of the Dark Soul. Yes. So that pigment is only found in the Ring City, I guess, and not like in every well, he, human. He wants the Dark Soul, which is like the pygmies. Ha- oh God, I don't know. Like <laughs> the the pygmies still. Like, I guess it's like when you when you fight Gwyn. Like Gwyn has Gwyn has given part of his soul to Seath and part of it to the Four Kings. But when you fight him, he still has a soul. Oh right, okay. So I guess like most of the dark soul is still in shared between the pygmy kings, but like all humans still have a little like piece of it. Okay, cool. Yeah, that makes sense. It's weird because like Dark Souls Three doesn't have a humanity mechanic. Yeah, why not? Well, th- that's that's what makes it hard to tell like exactly what's going on because in Dark Souls One, like Manus's soul. I think Manus's soul gives you a ton of humanity when you. Use oh no, no, Manus drops like ten humanity as long with along with his soul, so you can tell like this guy had a lot of, mm-hmm. a lot of dark soul and a lot of humanity in him. But the, the pygmy kings, because no one drops humanity, it's kind of hard to tell what exactly is going on with it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, could you please tell me what's the dark sigil? The Dark Sigil is... Are we talking about the... This is the are we talking about the ones that Yuri gives you? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. The Dark Sigil is... I think it's like... God knows. Like, it's, <laughs> it's helping... I'm going to look it up. Hang on. Okay. It has a specific description that okay, mentions cool. something. It looks like the Dark Sigil is kind of the same thing as the Dark Sign, but it doesn't have the Ring of Flame around. So what's happening is, rather than the Dark Sigil's flame thing keeping humanity inside you and stopping it from coming out, the Dark Sigil is is kind of encouraging it to come out. It's described as this is a this is a black gaping hole in your flesh and the darkness of humanity is seeping out of it. So like the more dark sigils you have, I guess like the more your humanity can kind of run rampant, Mm. but that's at the cost of you hollowing because you don't normally hollow. 
you need you it's like you need a dark sigil in you to properly hollow. Oh, was that in Dark Souls 1 as well? No. This this is the confusing thing because in Dark Souls 1 you it's the difference I guess between the Ashen one and, and a regular undead. Because in Dark Souls 1 you're a regular undead and you start off hollow. Mm-hmm. And if you take in humanity, you stop being hollow up until the next time you die and then you lose the it's kind of like being ended. Mm-hmm. Then you lose that humanity and go back to being hollow. In Dark Souls 3, you don't hollow until you get the Dark Sigil, at which point, once you're hollowing, you stay hollow, and unless you get the uh, the Firekeeper to heal it. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you. Do we, do we want to talk about the number of Dark Sigils? Yes, of course. Okay. So, the number of Dark Sigils, we need a total of eight to become the Lord of Londor. We need five of them, and then Henri has three for a total of eight. And then when you go to the Ring City, the Thrones of the Pygmy Kings are arranged, one side is five thrones and one side is three thrones. So it's the same number of sigils either side of that. (laughs) So it looks like it looks like there's something significant there about five and three being the numbers of sigils you need. I used to think it was just, we have five and Henri has three because Henri hasn't been through it as we have. Mm -hmm. And that's why. But now it looks like there is something, it is intentional that you need five and your spouse needs three. Hmm. And it might be because the number four, this is, I can't remember exactly, but like in Japanese, um, the number four, the way you say it, is is a homophone for the way you say death. Like they have the same sound to them. Mm-hmm. And I remember um, uh, hearing from from a Chinese person I knew that the number four is unlucky in Chinese because there is a there's a superstition about evil evil travels in a straight line. So if you have a character a, a as in a, a um, Chinese language character that's got a lot of right angles in it. That's an unlucky character because the evil travels into it, and then there's no way for it to get out because it hits the it hits the corner. Interesting. And that's why I think four is unlucky in that. And anyway, um, the way that four and death are linked in Japanese might be the reason it's that because five and three are both one away from four, and you're undead. So it's like you're kind of skirting death by by avoiding the number four, by being either a five or a three. I think it's that. I think it, and I, that's probably why there's four four kings in New Londo as well. Oh yeah. Well, that's cool. And that might be why the four kings of New Londo ended up succumbing to the abyss because there was four of them, instead of them trying to skirt it by being five or three. Huh. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, could you now tell me, please, what is a Lord of Cinder? Okay. Um, the first Lord of Cinder we run into is Gwyn. And the the way it's, going back to Japanese, the way it's written there is like, it's like firewood lord. The idea being like, it's a lord who is thrown on a fire to keep the fire going. So when you see Lord of Cinder, it's not supposed to be like, like a, I'm really powerful and my power is somehow connected to Cinder. It's that you are a Lord who is Cinder. Like you, you have been thrown onto this fire to keep this fire going and you're burning up and that's why you're a Lord of Cinder. So the way that like, The Lords of Cinder in Dark Souls 3 are these lords who they are they're made to link the fire, but like linking the fire is is like you have inherited fire. Like you you are you are becoming an embodiment of it. So they become like they inherit the power of fire and they become like an embodiment of fire, and as a result, that kind of burns them up. And that's so when the when the fire is weakened, 
when the fire starts to fade, they're called back to their thrones to burn up again to keep the fire going. But when we get there in Dark Souls 3, they've all refused to come back with the exception of Bloodlight. So it's like a sacrificial thing where you throw yourself on the fire, burn up, and then I guess you come back to life again, throw yourself on the fire again, and just keep doing that to, to uh, keep everything going. Mm-hmm. And in Dark Souls 3, they have all refused to come back again. So your job is to go and kill them and bring their bodies back and burn those. Awesome, thank you. Um, who was wondering... How are the Lords of Cinder chosen? We we hear different reasons why they're chosen, and some of them don't seem some of them seem to have made the choice themselves. The problem is that like we see three different versions of Phylink Shrine, but they all have the same names on the back of the thrones. So it's not clear, like, has it always kind of been the same five for a very long time, or have there been a whole lot of different Lords of Cinder and just these are the five that we're running into in our time. Because I like even... Um, when we kind of warp forward in time to that um, that like dreg heat place where we fight the Soul of Cinder, that's kind of implied to be in the future if you look at it in, uh, in tandem with the Ringed City. Because the Ringed City is happening in the future and that's in this dreg heat place, which is exactly what the end game area looks like. But if that's far into the future, then like if you look at the thrones, they still have like Yorm, Bloodleth, etc. written on them. So it's like I don't know. I don't know how many there have been. But like they all seem to have become a Lord of Cinder for different reasons. So like Ludleth is a Lord of Cinder because he he became one out of desperation. Because the fire was fading and he was apparently just some guy who, like, in a last-ditch effort to keep the fire going, they threw him on the fire and, and burned him up, and he became a Lord of Cinder that way. Yorm is said to have become a Lord of Cinder because, um, again, kind of out of desperation that, like, his his city was burning down. There was this There was this thing called the Profane Flame that was burning up the profaned capital and then when he became a lord of cinder that stopped the flame from from destroying it that like stopped it from from burning and i guess maybe he burned himself up in that in the profaned flame for some reason um and then you have like aldrich who it said like he became a lord of cinder but he became a lord of cinder because he was very very strong um he wasn't a, a virtuous or holy person they just used him as a Lord of Cinder because he was he was very, very powerful. And then you have like Lorien and Lothric who come from a, a like royal line of people who have traditionally always linked to the fire. They're all Lords of Cinder for different reasons, basically. Yeah, you also have uh, Watchers of the Abyss. I yeah, I don't quite get why they did that. Mm-hmm. It's uh why do they be I don't know why the why the abyss I think it it might be mentioned somewhere like why the abyss watches. Oh no 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 I remember now. Um it's not the abyss watches themselves, it's I think it's the blood of the wolf that they swear on. And it's like that's kind of like it, it's collectively together they're powerful to to link the fire. Because they're all kind of joined together by the blood of the wolf. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm. Cool. <laughs> um, you mentioned it, but uh, could you say what the soul of Cinder is? The soul of Cinder is um, the soul of Cinder is fucking stupid. The soul <laughs> of Cinder is the way it's described is like the soul of Cinder is something that's created out of the um the like spirits of all the other lords of cinder and it manifests to protect the fire the problem is we're just going to link the fire which is what it should want yeah so i don't know why we're fighting it it should just say go ahead <laughs> by all means by all means yeah. unless you have the sigil and it's like hey you this is the, this, sigil. this is the thing it would make sense and like you can summon uria and the londo pale shade to fight it mm-hmm so like it would make sense if 
it was if it was kind of like Bloodborne, where there's three possible final bosses, mm-hmm. where like you can just submit to German or you can fight German, and then if you've got the the three chords, you can fight the Moon Presence. This is like it would make sense if like you continued the Londor quest and then you fought the Lord of C- the Soul of Cinder to put the fire out or usurp the fire. Mm-hmm. But if you're just playing through normally, there is absolutely no reason why you would fight it. Right. It's like it, it's it's ridiculous. <laughs> and the other thing is like if you look at the CG intro, there's like a guy dressed as in Soul of Cinder's the Firelink armor set, who's like dragging like bodies around and stuff, and it's like, what? What was the deal with this thing? Because the way it's, it articulates in the finished product doesn't really make very much sense. A friend of mine who started a Dark Souls channel and then his iMac broke, so he couldn't keep working on it. Um, he he had a theory that like the the Firelink armor set was a a Lothric ceremonial armor set for them linking the fire. And the guy you see in the intro is like a uh, one of the former kings of Lothric who would who would wear that suit of armor. Mm. And like that that kind of works. Cool. Because Lothric's upset Lothric's whole history is linking the fire. Yeah, uh, I think yeah. I have uh, I have the link. I'll post it in the description. It's a really cool video. Yeah. Um, and you've explained this to me before <laughs> many times, but you okay. know, <laughs> the Ringed City. Like, yeah. The name of the city and the significance yeah. and the city of the ring and all that stuff. Could yeah. you talk about yeah. that? Well, the Ringed City is like. In the uh, in the Japanese, the, okay, the original title of Dark Souls was Dark Ring, and you can see this like there's really early trailers and, that are showing off like like how Bloodborne was called Project Beast at one point. It was called Beast Souls at one point. Um, Dark Souls was called like the working title for a long time was Dark Ring, and the Dark Sign in Japanese is still called Dark Ring. Like it's written phonetically, it's like a like Dakuringu, like that. So, but then in in uh, in English it became Dark Sign, which is like fine. But then when the Ring City comes along, that kind of backfired on it because the whole point is like it's the it's the Ring City is the city of the Ring, meaning both that it is it has a ring around it and it's the city of the Dark Sign. And you can see throughout the the city, there's all these statues of like, kind of look like pygmies, and they're they're like hunched over, and they're carrying this gigantic stone ring on top of them. So it's like, I think that's meant to like symbolically be, you know, we're all laboring under the laboring under the dark ring. It's like crushing us, but because it's called the dark sign in English, that that aspect is kind of lost in translation. Cool. Because like like the it's the ring it's so this is the ring city that Gwyn created to to wall off like he literally says to wall off the pygmies. And it's like that's like a macro version of what the dark sign is because the dark sign is a ring that walls off your humanity by by like cauterizing the wound in your body. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. Cool, and uh, you know the so the sword of a vowel, a vowel, yeah, a vowel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't speak English or know what lore is. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, <laughs> so uh. Uh, <laughs> it has a very um like like the top. It's it's basically like a yeah. Russian F. My my heart is sinking because I know where this is going. Go ahead. <laughs> It's just going to be about how there's a whole lot of like that symbol all over the Ring City. Yeah, what what's up with that? No, no idea. Because like the sword of a vowel is described as this is one of the sacred treasures of Londor, which is why when the Ring City trailer dropped, a lot of people were saying, "Oh, obviously this is set in Londor." 
because look, it's got the the symbol from Londor all over it. But it's not. It's somewhere completely different. And we never go to Londor. <laughs> and I, I think that like 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 I was talking about the statue before, and I like it's the same ring. So it's yeah. like it's a sword that is connected to the dark sign slash dark ring. Mm -hmm. But like so it makes sense for it to be in the ring city, but like I don't know what the story with the the exact thing with the sword is because, like, did someone from Londor get it from the Ring City? Did it? Like, I I don't know what the connection between the two of them is exactly. Uh, you know how there is this uh, monument of Valka or a giant purging yeah, stone, yeah. and has a yeah, sign yeah. on it. Could it just be Valka's sign or something? Well. I don't know. Like, Velka is like one of the two dozen plot threads that Dark Souls Three starts and then just drops. <laughs> like, like it, it has this real problem where like there's a difference between here is a story that ends ambiguously without us really like playing up exactly what what happened or like here is an idea that is floating around that has implications but we're not going to spell it out versus like a lot of the stuff in dark souls 3 which is like here's the first here's half a story mm -hmm. and then it just stops and it's like i don't know where this is going and i don't know what the point is <laughs> so like velka is flagged up really really heavily throughout dark souls 3 and you you have like the painted world comes back with all the crow people and you have like Frida dressing as though she's Velka, the statues of Velka, um, the Cathedral of the Deep looks like it was a a cathedral that worshipped Velka at one point but then like where does it go? Like it's just there. Mm -hmm. There doesn't seem... So like the, the purging monument in the Ring City uh, cures you of hollowing basically, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's like, yeah. They, they, oh, here we go. Like, because there's no humanity mechanic in Dark Souls 3. That took a long time. <laughs> because there's no humanity mechanic in Dark Souls 3, but you can still hollow. They made purging stones the thing that cures hollowing. But, like, previously purging stones had cured curse and cured poison and toxin which they still cure now but they also cure hollow uh -huh. and it just leads to this like every single dark souls game has completely changed what curse means because like in dark souls one curse is petrification and then in dark souls two petrification is a separate status effect and curse is it, curse is hollowing without dying because I know, I know you haven't played too much, but like mm -hmm. into um, like the basilisks from one are back, and they they can petrify you, but it's not called curse; it's called petrification. Okay, right. Okay, and then curse is a separate status effect that it hollows you without killing you. So every time the curse bar fills up, you like lose a chunk of your max hit points and you become hollow, but you don't die; it just happens. Mm -hmm. And then in and then in three, uh, curses back to being petrification again. Okay, and the and like in Dark Souls one, if you were cursed, it like was a permanent status effect until you used a purging stone. Right. In but in three, it is just an instant death attack, because there's no there's no max HP penalty. You just die. So, like, what exactly curses mean and how purging stones work, it's it's inconsistent from game to game. Hmm. Um, about the, uh, the sword of... A vowel. A vowel. <laughs> um, I just thought about it. You know where there's, uh, the swamp with the crabs? Yeah. Um, there, there are like crosses over there that look like the sword, aren't there? And there are guys carrying them too, like the statues. Oh yeah, that's um. I think what's going on there is like they're. It's like in Yarnum where they burn the beasts. 
because the guys in in the swamp who have the crosses it doesn't look like they're carrying them like intentionally it looks to me like they were strung up on the crosses and then like they were able to break free but the cross is still stuck to them because you see you see burning ones up as well so i think like they were they were strapping people to those and burning them because they were transforming into those monsters Oh, I see. And does the symbol have any significance there, or is this just... I don't... Random? You can't... You can't... Like, it's one of those things where, like, crosses are such a common symbol, like, everywhere, that it's hard to... Mm-hmm. If you just see two crosses, it's like, it maybe, maybe not. Like, I, I saw this this amazing thread on, on Game FAQs once, where people were trying to say that um, Shadow Tower and Dark Souls took place in the same world because there is the same, like, geometric pattern on some of, on some of the like walls. But it's like that's a really common pattern <laughs> yeah. that you can find in like multiples. It's like people who say that like, um, uh, the Egyptians and the Mayans must have both been visited by the same aliens because they both. <laughs> When it's like, no, pyramids are a good structure to build. <laughs> like <laughs> if you're if 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 your technology is at a certain level, you want to build pyramids. Like it it's just it's a it's a sensible thing to do based on you know where you are and what you have with you. Mm-hmm. So like like when I see like, well, they've both got crosses, it's like maybe I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Okay, cool. Thank you. Oh, and uh, Marty was wondering if there is any importance to the white and red flowers in the boss room of the Lord of Cinder. I, someone, I can't remember who and I can't remember where I saw it. Sorry. But like, <laughs> they were posting about how like those were a specific species of flower that grow um, after like that, that grow on like old lava beds or something like after something's been burned oh. I think it's it's meant because I think it's meant to be like a like a new life thing like a symbolic thing like like uh, the Lord of Cinder is dying and there's going to be a new age and it's represented by these flowers blooming on the, on the burned out kind of space on this arch tree ash tree arch tree ash tree arch tree cool thank you um So Dark Souls 3 was the first uh, Souls, well, not Souls, but, well, yeah, Dark Souls game I played. And so yeah. all these things were popping up, like all these, like, yeah. concepts. And and I was asking my boyfriend, like, what is this show? What does this all mean? This makes no sense. This game is so <laughs> stupid. 